Okay. Are we running? Anthony, um, back in the day, early um, experiences with a, a group of guys that you're beginning to develop music with. Let's take. Let's start the interview with um, beginning to write songs. You know, beginning to to write stuff that you thought, oh, this is kind of catchy and interesting. What were your influences? What were you listening to? You know, what what was the thing that kind of got stimulated you and excited you about music in 1968-9? Well, the, I mean, the initial the the, the group was initially two uh, groups of songwriters. One one of which was more influenced by the heavier kind of Rolling Stones R and B stuff. And Mike and I were in the school group doing uh, covers of Animals, Kinks, all the heavier stuff. Peter Gabriel and T Tony Banks kept was, was, I mean, we were all into the Beatles, but he was, he was a more of a Beatles than a Rolling Stones man. And Peter was more into Tamla than Mike and I were. So Tony was also more classically trained of verse. So they brought, there was a more sort of, um, a, both a more classical edge and perhaps less hard we were we we initially were the kind of rougher edge certainly but then mike and i discovered 12 string and then so that we then had a kind of lyrical arm but early on the others were the more cultured if you like what was it uh, um, 12 string is interesting to me what was it about 12 string that appealed to you um because it, it was a, it was different from uh, the uh, you know the average mm. boy with a guitar well, sort of arrived there by accident, really. Um, played a bit of acoustic, then played electric. Um, but um, like a lot of things, like most things at that age, you copy. Um, there were a number of well-known electric 12-string tracks, obviously Beatles songs, um, The Birds. Um, but the amount of songs I can remember on an acoustic 12 string whether that was the seminal instrument or almost almost none at that time it tended to be a sort of a strummed instrument with, and if you had too much plectrum sound it was a bit like a washboard i can only thank a chap called tony henson god knows wh where he is now and whether he's even alive but it literally was um i think it was it the hippie summer of 67 or was it the one before but he was playing a 12 string in a field at charterhouse and it was just like a road to damascus for me i just thought that is the most beautiful sound i just love the rich quality that you get with the octaves and um so i think whilst i'm very derivative in lots of respects i think that was we went down quite an original path because we weren't actually copying anybody I'm sure melodically we were, and there were some groups we were influenced by who were doing things with two guitars, like Fairport Convention with Richard Thompson, Simon Nichol, but it wasn't two 12 strings. And Mike and I would literally sit, you know, we'd have this, it was a sort of just a kind of sonic feast. We'd kind of say, you play E minor, I'll play D, and we'd do it at the same time. And of course, with all the octaves on the 12 strings, it created this fantastic kind of shimmering sort of thing, it was very different to, I think, what a lot of other people were doing. So um, that was fun, yeah, it was great sound, loved it. It sounds like you were excited by the pure musicality of it, rather than um, you know, Ooh, let's let's try and write something that is you could define as say pop music. Yeah, I think that we didn't sort of sit down and say, oh yeah, we can use this to write a hit song. We weren't. We were still at school, so there was you know we we'd been signed uh, well, around the same time we were signed by Jonathan King, but I don't think there was a sort of you know, to do it for a living. It was all just a lot of fun. So there was no thought of, yeah, yeah, we can use this to write a hit song. It was just exploration. And if something catchy or commercial came out of it, so much the better. You were signed by Jonathan King, King of Hits, uh, as he calls himself now. Uh, probably did then. Um, presumably at that point, it was like he was the guy you knew about because he'd been to Charterhouse. What was the story? Well, the story is, is, is four extremely feeble and, and frightened people and one brave friend of ours called John Alexander. And we'd done these demos um, and it was OC's day, old Carthusian day. Jonathan King was spotted there and we had the demo tape, but we were too frightened to go and give it to them. So John Al, as he was known, 
he was he was never phased by anybody so he just went up and just gave it to him and 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 king as we called him liked one he liked the song that was done by accident because the demo session was mike and i saying tony will you come and help us with the keyboards and he said yep i'll do it if my mate peter gerber can come along and sing one song and that was the one that john Lee king liked didn't like either of them because mike and i were writing some pretty rough stuff that is sorry that is pre-12 string that was pre-12 string stuff we were in between sort of you know bad rolling stones and i don't know where we were but um they had this lovely song and we were signed really on the basis of that i think on that song and maybe other potential he saw and been the others what was that song it was called um she is beautiful which became oh dear help it became a different song it changed titles i think um it wasn't the silent sun it wasn't the silent sun it was before the silent sun silent sun came later after we after we'd been drilled in the art of trying to write short pop songs by jonathan king which i resisted i didn't like the silent sun at all so on the strength of one song that he that he liked and it was great it's a lovely song yeah it was it was called she is beautiful to start with i'm not sure what it ended up as it was a lovely song yeah um and they had some lovely songs in their locker which is why the first album was dominated by their stuff as mike and i were sort of finding our writing feet um silent sun was the single did that come out before the album silent sun very much so yeah i mean we started off um doing demos for jonathan and we were signed in the middle of 67 that's right all the dads had to come to the meeting because we were too young and then see we were at school for another year and a half so during that time we we, we started writing songs and we started because it was around the time when the beatles were you know you had to think about what was going on at the time you know we'd moved through all the early beatles you know we weren't i want to hold your hand anymore we were day in the life so we were writing these epics you know with loads of different sections and of course jonathan king was completely what are you guys doing you know i want you to have a hit um which is fair enough so peter and tony started sort of trying to write more short form stuff so silent sun was the so i thought it was dead bland because i i liked all the more poncy stuff because that's where we'd arrived if you think in, in you know in musical language um but uh, and it wasn't a hit and thank god it wasn't i don't say that through sour grapes because i just think that we didn't have a style we didn't really have a, a proper style you know and and jonathan king was trying to in a way make us in slightly in his own image we'd had hedgehog as anonymous and you know i thought everyone's gone to the moon was a lovely song well well done him he was prided himself the only knew seven chords and he used them well but if we had been successful the group would never have developed its its proper style and voice it would have been a disaster um and we did another single called winter's tale that wasn't successful and then jonathan came very kindly sort of said well okay you know you've towed the line with me um do your own thing up to a point and he was very decent because you know just just let us loose on an album um we didn't start doing loads of five or six million epics but we were back in territory definitely not verse chorus you know uh bang on nailed on chart stuff there were a couple of things that were possible i think there were i can't remember what was released as a single but it certainly wasn't successful so he was very decent um in that respect so it went two singles weren't successful and then the album which sold about 600 i think we knew everyone that bought it just about and we haunted the corridors at the bbc that summer 69 desperately trying to you know um interest people and nobody was interested and at that point the group nearly broke up and there was this it was right on the cusp of do we have a go at changing into a live band going on the road and it was really it was really toss up almost didn't well come to that in a sec um just going back to the recording of that is it right that it was all done in in one day one recording session in one day um no it was i mean it, we, we had to get on with it we had to get on with it i can't remember how many days but it would have been a number of days um we probably did about i don't know i'm guessing actually should have kept a diary really three or four songs a day then would have been vocals probably maybe a week ten, i'm guessing a week ten days that kind of thing do you remember the, do you recall the sort of uh, atmosphere of, of putting this together was was it was it exciting or? loved it absolutely yeah. loved it that summer we went from one friend's parents sort of house 
some of them country houses one one was rather quite big and it was we just did a week's rehearsal at each place then ended up by doing demos at Brian Roberts's place in in Chiswick and um, then did the album I mean it was a schoolboy dream if you liked if you like music I hardly remember an argument everyone seemed to agree and um, it was just it was a really kind of heady time um, um, were you looking back now I mean how how sort of green were you very very uh well i don't think i was green in the sense of thinking it was going to be we'd we'd come down to earth with the two singles not being successful so we weren't sort of thinking oh yeah the album is going to be i, I think what we probably thought was that uh, the single drawn to singles are drawn to blank because they didn't in my opinion have a lot of individual character that was different to other groups um they could have been almost anybody um I think what we probably hoped with the album that the album did have the beginnings of our own style and that therefore people would latch onto it but they but we sort of missed really on that which is disappointing um can i just, can I just check is that window short or is it open a bit if oh we're getting a bit of why genesis the title jonathan king's idea Can you recall what, it, what was his reasoning behind it? How did this come about? I can't, to be honest. He certainly wasn't a devout Christian. Um, it's been used as a brand name for many things since, and obviously, you know, given the given the genesis of the word, you know, the beginning of things, and, and therefore implying um, fundamental creativity, not a bad title. But it was, as I'm sure you know, there was an American genesis. So for for a while, we were going to change our name to Revelation, um, but then I think they disappeared. So we ended up by carrying, keeping going with the name. But hence the title of the record. Absolutely. From Genesis to Revelation. Well, I mean, it also was was this in any way a concept that contained all the songs? I mean, the Genesis Revelation sort of theme. Uh, for instance, the serpent. Well, not really. I mean, there was a sort of loose, loose concept to the, to a very loose concept uh, to to the album, which was a sort of you know development through time. Because if you think you've got in the beginning, uh, in the, the oceans and motion and all that kind of stuff is talking about the turbulent early you know uh, prehistoric times. Um, but it was pretty loose. I mean, not all the songs fall into that category at all. It's I mean, like one day. It's just a you know a love song and Am I Very Wrong and stuff like that. So um, um, it, there's a sort of quasi journey going on with the end track place to call my own. But um, I think some of Pete's lyrics were develop it were sort of developed the concept. You know, sort of early man who's confused like in the wilderness and stuff like that uh, in hiding. Um, but it was um, it was not a tight concept. Right, and Pete was 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 the driving force lyrically. Wrote most of them, yeah. Wrote most of them, certainly. Certainly, at that point, he did, yeah. Um, a lot of the time, we didn't have any idea what he was singing about, actually, because he was quite he knew some quite he was not a particularly talkative person, then, or wouldn't regale with long words, but. I remember there was a song we had called, which never was recorded, called Masochistic Man, and there was a line, carve the Eglin time with bitter juices of your body. And none of us knew what the hell an Eglin is, it's a rose, I think. But So he was he was often quite, quite kind of um, erudite in a way, very descriptive, symbolic, yeah. But sort of intriguing and mysterious. Absolutely, and of course he, he took that, you know, to a greater height later. Um... Just to go back on that first single, which um, we now know the title of, uh, do you want to just uh, r recall that again? So? Well, it was the yeah the first the first song um, that was um, caught Jonathan King's eye was was on the first group of demos was called originally was called She Is Beautiful, which I've been rem reminded by my colleagues it became the serpent on the first album. Yeah, and a very good song it was too. Uh, it failed to. Uh, it certainly didn't make it as a single. Did it turn up as a no, I mean, I think it had a lot of potential. I don't think it was, it was, a, it was a classy song, but it wasn't a surefire single. I think the first one they released from 
was it where Sar turns to sweet? In fact, in fact, Sar turns to sweet was released before the before um, Silent Sun. I just remembered that, um, uh, or at least it was done. Sorry, it was done as a single. But then in the hippie summer of 67, it wasn't released. That's right. But no, I don't think She is Beautiful, The Seven. I don't think any of the songs on From Genesis to, to Revelation were, were, were surefire singles. No. Moving on. So you have this Jonathan King period where essentially, I guess, the band is <clears throat> driven by the, the pop ethic in a way. You're, you're yeah. trying to produce short songs. Yeah. But, you know, that will make it into the charts. The, the the lack of interest in that, I mean, was that good in the sense that you could then be free to expand your ideas and develop as musicians? Well, I think with the benefit of hindsight, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? At the time, it was deeply depressing. Obviously, when the singles weren't successful, we were disappointed. But uh, as I was saying earlier, I think it's probably a good idea that we weren't successful because we probably would have just trotted out facsimile stuff and wouldn't have developed. Um, you know, there was a lot of kind of birth pains in, in the in the in the um, process by which the group arrived at its its more identifiable cogent style a couple of years later, um, and. Um, it, it certainly was a difficult period. We were very disappointed when, from Genesis Revelation, didn't achieve any success. In fact, we were so we were so depressed about it. We, uh, you know, it really was. I was just saying earlier, it was touch and go whether the group would actually go on. You know, go on to what? Because we weren't a live group. We were a group of songwriters. That was we. That's what we were signed as, and really effectively, we did pretty much record the album. Still a bit like that in, in a way. Um, and John Silver, the drummer, was going to go to America to Cornell University, so we were back to the four of us with no drummer. Um, Mike didn't play much bass, um, so there was no, it was, you know, the university was coming up, and um, it was, it really was touch and go. And then so we decided to go on the road. Um, and everything sort of things weren't all planned out you know it all sort of really happened by accident um but one of the things i was mentioning that was difficult was him tony was a piano player you know anybody any who plays keyboards would tell you that the difference between playing something that's you know got a loud and soft piano forte and playing a you know an organ or a harpsichord is completely different you know you just don't have the control over the key and he found the uh, you know but it's also the amplification problem he found it very very difficult in fact you know and he really hated the organ to start with and was used to call it a box of tricks and stuff and um it was a question of finding another drummer and so the whole thing was pretty fraught um and we were we were we were some pretty disillusioned boys during that song we had one or two people one or two who disappeared off into the ether who were very encouraging and kept saying you know you've got something you should do this go on with it and i'm all, you know be very grateful to those guys because it really was touch and go you know we just mooched around getting very de depressed but um um any memories of um the typical gig at that point well by this no well we haven't quite got to where we gigged yet we haven't quite got there we were kind of starting to to go out there and play in a few odd places right? well yeah. the summer of 69 we mooched around country houses and eventually decided to give it a go we played at a, a, a summer's 21st and we were pretty awful to be honest um and it was after that that uh, Richard McPhail's parents lent us the country cottage for the winter. And we did a couple of weeks at my parents' place first and knocked a few um, sort of tracks designed as live music tracks, which is what we'd never really done before. We'd just written songs, you know, to, to perhaps try and be a hit or not. But we were now writing things that were much harder edged, things which were quite dramatic. The knife, for instance, was written during that period. I mean, not a whole lot of it, but it's very different to what what was on the previous on the previous albums. And so, um, so we arrived. It was a pretty quick change, although Tony found the organ tricky to start with. I mean, he adapted to it amazingly well, and Mike um, almost overnight became a very good bass player. Worked very very hard at it. Um, so I suppose. I, well, I mean, I can't remember exactly when the first gig was, but it would be something like October. 
maybe late September, perhaps yeah, probably October 69. And um, and we, we obviously we were really rough around the gills because we didn't actually put us in front of a live audience. We didn't really know what to do. But but the, some of the material was already on the way. Um, and we kind of refined it and just got a bit better. We started off by doing quite a lot of quiet songs as well. Um, uh, there was a sort of um, intermediate uh, set of material which was sort of owed something to from Genesis to Revelation, but was sort of more, if you like, sort of, if you like, sort of putting Crutus progressive from Genesis to Revelation, which rather died on the road, which was sad because because you know we were playing gigs where we weren't playing concerts you know we did play brighton dome and a few others where people would listen but we had a bizarre set of gigs uh because we had a lot of different agents and we had agents that would put us in you know watford tech on a friday night with the lads who just want to you know hang out and they don't want to listen to a lot of quiet poncy music why should they done and um, then we'd be playing a, a really bizarre nightclubs in london with italian arms dealers and gangsters shades and of course the last thing they wanted to do they just wanted to smooch so the whole thing was a complete misnomer a lot of it but occasionally we'd pitch up at these these just perfect pubs or big club uh, big pubs or clubs like friars farks and one or two of the others and then the audience did listen and we started building up a bit of a head of steam at those sort of places and but overall there weren't enough of those to for the some of the quieter songs to so we gradually started shunting off some of these quieter songs and um ended up with um you know a louder more dynamic set and the thing about the knife is uh it's got a harder edge i mean the knife yeah obviously but uh, the sound, um, and it's got this. This uh, I think Steve Hackett would talk about how you you have the, the kind of clash between um, the quiet and you know something which uh, can, can uh, jump out at you mm. and, and uh, surprise you, and, you know, shake you into a sort of a <clears throat> an awareness of wow, you know. We're not all just in a stupor here, sort of yeah, yeah. drifting through this. Um, quite a, a bit of excitement in it, a bit dynamic. It struck me that that's possibly the beginning of a move into where you can you could maybe link it up to um, Watcher in the Sky, mm. Supper's Ready, Absolutely. Music Box, you know, mm. those kinds of Genesis numbers, which we we equate with a sort of classic Genesis period. Um, which which you in, had a hand in at that point, and also um, I think wasn't Music Box being written at the time that you were still with the band as well. Well, Mike and I got together on a few of the original bits that ended up in that. Um, I mean, he developed it with the group long after I'd gone, but um, we, we he he kicked it off. It was a tuning called F sharp tuning. And we did we did some of the initial bits on that, couple of the initial bits on that, which are absolutely right. I mean, the looking back on it, the um, the knife and looking for someone, I think they and stagnation, they threw down a, a sort of it was, it was like a template, I suppose, for what was to come, which is often the uh, you know you kick off you kick off with a song which is often quite quiet, and then it goes through an enormous amount of changes, often quite dramatic, often quite um, um, aggressive. Um, and then quite often would would come back. Uh, I mean, it's quite a traditional form, isn't it? You've got the old A B A, but this, but 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 the B would be extended through a lot of different sections um, before you get back to the in, in classical terms, the sort of recapitulation. Um, I mean, the knife was actually called the knife because um, this is going to disappoint people because the original song by Pete and Tony sounded like the nice, so it was just known as the knife. And then actually, Pete's lyrics are not about revolution they're a spoof at revolutionaries which again is kind of <laughs> kind of probably probably disappoints people because peter was not a revolutionary um we were just you know middle class boys but um but it was very quick you're, you're right i mean i don't really quite know how it happened i mean there was the influence still from the beatles and there was influence from clearly on that one from from the nice and mike and i were being very influenced by uh, there was influence from Procol Harum, influence from Family Fair, Fair Book Convention. So some of those groups were influencing the original 
song but then we were going off and i think probably the influence when we were going off onto the instrumental sections everybody would probably have to admit was king crimson because they'd thrown the gauntlet down within the core of the crimson king for incredibly dramatic and very tight playing hugely powerful and dramatic and so we were mesmerized by that not so much by the very fast jazzy stuff because that wasn't really liked it but it wasn't really our bag so you've got some mixture of the early songwriting influences and then and then the crimson with their enormous um, live prowess so all this was going into the mix around the time we set off um you know it's difficult to say isn't it with the melting pot exactly what what con elements but that that's those were the elements that, that i think constitute you know a lot to um to the fact that there's somebody at the front door uh, <laughs>